Hello and welcome to another lesson on acoustic treatment this time. I'm excited because 2024 is going to be a different shift on this channel, uh, mainly focusing on more acoustics of rooms, um, more on isolation as well, but especially from a lot of the design ideas from Philip Newell, who wrote uh, Recording Studio Design. And he is one of the top studio designers in the world, and so it's great to learn from him as well. So I'm going to spread that information out on this channel as well. So just keep that in mind. Today we're going to be talking about one of his designs for a neutral studio room. And this design can also be used in a control room. Um, and it's a great way to contain the low frequencies of a room and absorb down to 30 hertz. And this is essentially going to be a broadband diaphragmatic absorber. So as you've probably learned through my channel and other channels, it's really hard to absorb low frequencies with your traditional acoustic panel with insulation and fabric covering that in a frame and the best way to absorb low frequencies is to essentially trap them absorb them with a pressure containment system and that's exactly what i'm going to teach you how to do today and uh, this is going to be a great solution if you have the budget uh, it's not super super expensive but it's also not super super cheap so before we jump in i do want to let you know that i have a free resource for you that is my free acoustic treatment guide and this will help you with designing a really great home studio room at a more reasonable budget than the design I'm going to be talking about right now. But either way, wherever you are in this journey of making your ideal home recording studio, uh, that will be a helpful resource to you as well. So to download that, you can go to soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. That is soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic. All right, let's dive into this lesson on how to build an acoustic panel that absorbs down to 30 hertz. All right, let's go. <laughs> So like I mentioned at the introduction of this video, I have been pouring through Philip Newell's 750 page book on recording studio design. And it's been to my surprise, but also to, you know, a, a good surprise that this book has actually been more philosophical and much more fascinating than I thought it would be. I thought it would just be a textbook of like, do this, then do this, then do this. And it's more of this getting inside Philip Newell's mind, learning about his ideas around acoustics, his experience, and then just really taking that information and then trying to use it in your own designs for recording studios. So this is important to know at the outset that this is his design, not mine. And I want to give him credit where credit is due for that. Let's talk about how this design works. So if you look at this diagram here I made in SketchUp, this shows essentially what you would do if you were creating this wall in your studio. So it's important to know that I, I said acoustic panel and I sort of misled you, but this could be turned into an acoustic panel as well. But in Philip Newell's designs, this is the wall design of all four walls of his live room or it could be three of the walls of the control room. He usually likes to use the front wall as like a solid concrete or stone wall, and he flush mounts the speakers. So just keep that in mind, but this wall is the absorption acoustic wall in all of his studio designs. And the way that it works, as you can see here, is that it starts with an air gap from your isolation wall. Now your isolation wall can be what I usually tell everyone to do, which is a double wall system with two layers of drywall on each side, or it could be what Philip Newell likes to do, which is having a sand-filled concrete block wall uh, and having two of those sand-filled concrete block walls or having an existing wall in the built room you're building with that's already brick or mortar or concrete, something heavy, and then he builds a, an isolated concrete wall from that. So remember, Philip Newell is like hardcore, he's got huge budgets. For us lowly home studio folk, dealing with concrete and sand filled blocks can add up very quickly and you lose a lot of space. So, but that's good to remember that, you know, your outside isolation wall is not necessarily part of the acoustic system, even though it does affect the acoustics of the room. So what we wanna do is build our acoustic wall at least two to four inches from the isolation wall. And that's important. We can't just have that acoustic wall right up against our isolation wall because the air gap is extremely important. Just like in soundproofing, the air gap's important. As in acoustic treatment of the low end, the air gap is also very important. Ideally, you know, we could get that air gap anywhere from one to three feet, which is what Philip Newell actually says is best and what was done in the BBC Camden designs. Um, 
But he says that because so many studio designers are not willing to give up, or studio owners, I should say, are not willing to give up one to three feet of their room space all the way around, uh, he's designed this design, which I'll go over, that allows you to only go two to four inches, but has much more mass and, and insulation involved in it. So that said, we're going to have that two to four inch gap. Then we hit our first layer, which in this case, I'm using Knopf Ecos insulation. It's three pound um, density. And Philip Newell recommends using cotton waste felt of 60 kilograms per meter cubed of density, which is roughly three pounds per foot square foot cubed of density in the United States. So if you're able to get cotton waste felt, I think it's a lovely idea. I love the idea of reuse, screen, recycle, and the idea that it's not some sort of fiberglass insulation, which can cause itchy skin or hurt your lungs or something like that. Uh, I just couldn't find it in an affordable fashion here in the United States. So if you can find it awesome, let me know. Um, you could use cotton waste felt instead of the Knopf Ecos insulation I'm recommending here. Either way, the Knopf Ecos rec uh, insulation is fairly cheap, coming in about, I think, 74 cents per square foot. And that's when you cut it in half. Since we're only using one inch uh, thickness, you can cut the two inch bat in half and put it on onto your acoustic wall. And then we have a dead sheet, and Philip Newell talks a lot about dead sheets, which a lot of us, you know, a dead sheet is pretty much equivalent to mass loaded vinyl. But I like the fact that he calls it a dead sheet because mass loaded vinyl is just one type of product that achieves the same goal, which the dead sheet is essentially supposed to be a limp elastic membrane that has a lot of inertia, meaning like a punching bag. If you punch a punching bag, it has a lot of inertia. The punching bag won't move. It's got all that mass. Um, and so it doesn't bounce back at you. And so something with a lot of mass inertia, and then also is very flexible, which is what the punching bag scenario, it can swing, it can move back and forth. It's not like punching a, a solid wall. And then you're just like, ow, my hand hurts really bad. So we use mass loaded vinyl. You can use like a rubber material. All these things will do the same thing that Philip Newell is talking about, which is having that damping layer. Um, so we're going to put that in there. Mass loaded vinyl at one pound this is what he recommends. Uh, I think it's five kilograms per meter squared is what he recommends for the dead sheet. He also recommends something called PKB2, which is available, I believe, in Spain or manufactured in Spain, which is like a dead sheet compound with the fabric already attached to it, the cotton waste felt attached to it. So that's cool. If you're in Europe, you can get that. And uh, then we're going to go through. We have another layer of the Knopf Ecos insulation. And then we have our half inch drywall. Um, so plasterboard, if you're in Europe or in other places, same thing, half inch, 13 millimeter. And then we have another layer of the one pound mass load of vinyl, another layer of the half inch drywall. And then that is finally attached to our wood frame. And I will say, if you're wondering, how do you attach all these layers? Uh, he recommends using contact adhesive, which is kind of a fancy word for glue. Uh, and it, it's a really strong rubber based glue that you can get at any hardware store. And I would just sandwich all those layers together with contact adhesive. And then you could actually screw in uh, the drywall sandwich to the frame. And in the US, we'll use a two by four frame. He recommends using a or like a five by 10 millimeter centimeter uh, wood timber. Sorry, I'm trying to learn my metric <laughs> by heart. Um, so, you know, similar style framing, we use 16 inches on center here in the U S and then you can put, uh, Owens Corning, uh, R13 insulation, just like you would your exterior walls of your studio. And this is what I recommend doing. He says to fill it with cotton waste felt either way. It's doing the same thing. It's, it's causing resistance in that air cavity. So you don't get resonance in there and increasing your isolation and, uh, and your acoustic low frequency absorption. And then once we finish uh, go building that out, then we're going to add the final layer of mass loaded vinyl on the outside of our wall, seal that up. You know, I would use acoustic sealant because we do want that chamber to be airtight in there for this to properly work. And then we finish that off with another one inch layer of Knopf Ecos insulation on the outside of this acoustic wall. It's a lot. It's big. So if you were curious, like how much space does that whole wall take up? Well, you've got your two to four inches in your air gap. Let's say you do two inches. And then the actual acoustic wall is going to be seven and three eighths of an inch. Um, and if you did, you know, four inches, you'd get up to 11 inches out from the wall. So almost a whole foot 
Uh, that's close to a meter for you, all the, all of you in the metric system. And about 22 centimeters, I think is what he said in the book, is what it usually comes out from the isolation wall. So imagine you're losing 22 centimeters or, you know, eight inches, almost eight inches, all the way around your room. So you got to imagine your room shrinks. But as Philip Newell says over and over and over again in his book is that when we're designing studios, we are constantly in the battle between more space and better acoustics. And you can't have both. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You either lose space and have better sounding acoustics, or you have a bigger studio with worse sounding acoustics. And he's of the school of thought, which I think I'm leaning in that direction too, which is like why I spend all the money on a studio room that has poor acoustics, just so that you feel like you have more space. Um, there is a fine balance there in our home studio market, but that's something to keep in mind as you think about this whole design. So how does this system work? You might be wondering, okay, this is like a lot of materials. It's very complex. And why all the craziness with this? Why can't I just put an insulation panel, a panel with, you know, fiberglass insulation on my wall, cover it in fabric and call it a day. And the reason is, you know, those panels only, and if you use four inches of insulation, they'll only go down to 125 hertz. That's the lowest that you can actively absorb with those panels. Um, the more of them you put around the room, the more the whole room will have a, a more continuous low frequency response, but it's still never going to be quite perfect. Whereas these panels that Philip Newell are talking about because of this pressure component where we're actually sealing up a cavity and we're creating lots of mass and using lots of damping, that's actually helping with the low frequency absorption. And as he says in his book, this should work down to 30 hertz, which is really great. 20 hertz is the threshold of hearing. A lot of our speakers don't even go down below 30 hertz unless you have a, a subwoofer. So keep that in mind. So the way this works is we're just going to travel through the panel as if we were a sound wave. And this is a great way to kind of imagine what's happening with this acoustic panel. So first, the sound wave will hit the NOF insulation on the outside. It'll go through like a fabric covering. You could even have the fabric, you know, built out a little bit from this acoustic wall and frame the fabric with like a very, very cheap framed wall, I think is what he does. Or you could kind of create a system where the fabric goes directly over the NOF insulation um, as well, but that will make it, that's the fabrics just there for the aesthetics, for the look, but the sound will hit that NOF insulation and the high frequencies to mid frequencies, you know, roughly around 500 Hertz will be absorbed just by that one inch layer of NOF insulation. And then it's going to hit the mass load of vinyl, which is going to vibrate at certain frequencies. And some of those frequencies are then going to be dissipated by the damping of the dead sheet. Then some of those frequencies will make it through the dead sheet into the fiberglass cavity of our two by four wall. And that some of those sounds, uh, frequencies will be absorbed in that fiberglass and turned into heat as it travels through. Then it's going to hit the, the rigidness of our half inch drywall. And some of the low frequencies will be absorbed by that drywall because it's a more rigid, massive structure. And then that drywall is going to vibrate and hit the mass loaded vinyl in there, which is again, going to damp some of those frequencies that are remaining again and absorb some more of them. And then it's going to hit the the half inch drywall on the other side of that uh, MLV mass load of vinyl and even more of those lower frequencies are going to be absorbed. And then that sound is going to hit the second or in this yes, yeah, second layer of NOF eco insulation. So some of the more of the higher frequencies will be absorbed that are still left there. And that's going to vibrate the mass load of vinyl, which is going to hit the next layer of eco insulation. And so some of the mid to low frequencies are going to hit be uh, absorbed again, then it goes through the air cavity and hits your isolation wall. And then that air cavity with the insulation in it is working a lot like our soundproof wall system. So that's absorbing the sound of the low, lower end as well. And then the sound bounces off and has to go through the entire system again in reverse. So as you can see, there's so many points with different materials throughout the system where each frequency range can be attenuated, absorbed. And that's the point that Philip Newell is trying to make. He's, he's saying through experience, test testing and in practice of using this design, he's found this to work well with absorbing down to 30 Hertz and having all the different layers is what makes it work in that way. And then having the sealed pressure cavity is what makes it work as well. So the next question you're probably wondering is how much does this dang thing cost? And you may have seen in one of my slides earlier that I put that in there. It's a I added up all the costs of the US dollar materials if I were to build a studio here in the United States. 
and it would be about eight dollars and sixty five cents per square foot which is is kind of costly you know it's it's not terrible but it's also not great and that doesn't include the cost of framing out the two by four wall 16 inches on center or 24 inches on center um, depending on the weight load you're going to put on it with your acoustic ceiling and we'll talk about that in another video but basically you know, $8.65 per square foot, if you were going to do like roughly a 15 foot by 20 foot room, which is what a lot of us are kind of working in, if you're lucky to have that much space, even, um, you know, that'll cost you around $2,500 in materials. Again, add that frame wall in, it might be a little bit higher, but roughly that's what you're going to be looking at for getting all four walls done. Uh, and then when you think about the ceiling, you know, you're looking at another, uh, thousand to $2,000. So let's just say four to $5,000 to properly acoustically treat a live room. And if you're doing a control room, Philip Newell recommends either choosing the live end dead end, which is what I like a lot, where you absorb the front end of the room and leave the back wall more uh, diffusive, or you flip it around and you absorb all the sidewalls in the back wall and you leave the front of the of the room um, very reflective with something like stone um, and flush mount the speakers. And that's what he likes to do. So in a control room, you can get away with doing just three of the walls, whereas in a live room, it's good to do all four of the walls and then using uh, wood slats in a different, in a pattern that allows for a somewhat reflective ambiance can liven up that control, that live room, excuse me. And we'll, I'll talk about that in a future video as well. So there's so much to unpack here, but this video is meant to just teach you about this very important aspect of Philip Newell's designs that I think is fascinating in terms of overcoming this hurdle that we all face in the home recording studio world of how do we treat our low frequencies. A lot of people will lean towards bass traps, which essentially is just fabric placed across a corner and a bass trap, all it really does is the air gap behind the insulation. So let's say you have like four inches or maybe even six inches of insulation. Um, and then you have a foot or two feet air gap behind that in the corner. Um, well, that's going to help you attenuate down to lower frequencies because of that air gap behind the insulation. But that's about it. You know, that's why we use base, base traps in the corners. It's not really doing much else. When you start getting into broadband pressure traps, which is what Philip Newell is kind of getting at, then you're attacking those low frequencies with much more than just an air gap and insulation. So that's something to keep in mind, uh, just about the physics of how acoustics works. I will say the only other person I've seen who's really actively pushing this a lot with broadband pressure-based diaphragmatic absorbers is, is Acoustic Fields. And if you've watched a lot of his videos, you know, he's got a, his own proprietary system and it's very expensive. You know, for a room I just mentioned, I bet it would cost like twenty to $40,000 to use the the acoustic fields treatment to do this. So when you compare, you know, $40,000 versus $5,000, you, you start to see the benefit of Philip Newell's design. Um, but it's the same concept. Uh, the concepts are what are important. The idea of absorbing diaphragmatically, using different materials to absorb, having the sound pass through multiple layers. These are all really interesting ways that we can start to expand the traditional home studio uh, methods of acoustically treating your room. No shade on just throwing up acoustic panels. I've been doing it for years. I've had my songs played on, you know, HBO, on all the big streaming services, all that stuff, Netflix. Um, so people don't really notice necessarily, but for you, for you who's obsessed with sound and you want to hear, you know, what the sound really is, this method will get you closer to that truth. All right. That was a lot. I hope you've enjoyed this. Again, if you are on this journey of soundproofing, building a home recording studio, check out that free acoustic treatment guide. Uh, just go to soundproofyourstudio.com slash acoustic, and uh, I hope you enjoy it. All right, I'll see you all next week with some more info on acoustics and soundproofing. Mm -hmm.